What we've learned empirically and through uh, many research studies now is that people who have insulin resistance, so metabolic syndrome or type 2 diabetes, do much better when they restrict carbohydrates. In fact, their disease, the process of insulin resistance in the body, uh, manifests itself functionally as a form of carbohydrate intolerance. So intuitively, uh, if you have an intolerance to a nutrient, such as lactose intolerance, uh, gluten intolerance, you avoid that nutrient. And so when we describe a, the condition of insulin resistance as carbohydrate intolerant, uh, I think most people will, will understand that it's very rational then to restrict that nutrient. And in fact, when we do that, uh, we see that many of the features of insulin resistance uh, improve and, and folks uh, respond very favorably to that type of diet. The body differs. It's when we eat, consistently eat carbohydrates. Carbohydrates become the body's first line fuel. That's what the body is expected to burn, in part because we can store very little carbohydrate in our bodies. So if you eat a fair amount every day, that has to go to the front of the line to get burned, which means that fat gets kind of blockaded and put in reserve. That's what extra adipose tissue is, is reserve. It, when you restrict carbohydrates, as Jeff said, for a few weeks, the body goes through an adaptation process, and now fat becomes the body's first line fuel. And it becomes the body's, in essence, high octane fuel. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes a period of time for that to occur. But what differs is the the, the, the basic fuel flow system of the body. And as Jeff implied, um, from a, a, a evolutionary perspective, you know, whether humans lived as hunters and ate very little carbohydrate or whether they had to go through periods of prolonged fasting in between crops if they were subsistence farmers, there have been periods of time in human history where all of us have been, our, our metabolism had to adapt to a low carb uh, uh, situation. And the human physiology is very adaptable to get through that, given, as we say, that modest period of time to make the switch from a high carb fuel system to a high fat fuel system. People vary one from another. Some people, the people have diseases or conditions associated with insulin resistance or carbohydrate intolerance have to get quite low in their carbohydrates. It doesn't mean zero carbs, but when we do it in grams per day, you get into a, this adapted state. We call it keto adaptation because the body in, starts making ketones when you get low in carbs under 50 grams a day. But we know people who are very insulin resistant, patients or colleagues of ours, and again, some of our most interesting patients are fellow physicians who are doing low carb, that they have to be under 25 grams of carbohydrate per day to be on a diet that allows them to get into the sustained fuel flow where fat becomes the body's primary fuel. So for one person, it might be 25 grams a day if they're severely insulin resistant. For a person who's carbohydrate tolerant, then maybe they can eat 100 or so grams of carbohydrate per day still get the benefits of mod a modest degree of carbohydrate restriction. So there's no one perfect diet for everyone. It really has to be individualized uh, to allow each person to find that, I won't, shouldn't say sweet spot, but I will, sweet spot for them dietarily that lets them feel and function well. When I was in my 20s, 30s, 40s, up to my early 50s, I could tolerate vast amounts of carbohydrate and do just fine. When I passed the age 50 threshold, I started gaining weight in the middle. I started gaining blood pressure and using all the the best techniques of, quote, balanced diet, mm -hmm. using high fruit and vegetable and, and low saturated fat and lots of dairy, uh, low fat dairy, all the things that are supposed to control blood pressure. My blood pressure was getting to a point where it was dangerous. The only way I got my weight and my blood pressure under control was switching to low carb. And I stay under 50 grams per day and have done for close to a decade now. If you ask if most dietitians or doctors, they'll tell you that ketones are, are toxic byproducts of fat metabolism. And that's because most of us trained in clinical medicine learn about ketones in the context of diabetic ketoacidosis. That's ketones up here, numbers of 15 or 20 in the, in the, on, a, on a test. My ketones, nutritional ketosis, are here in the 1 to 3 range. Okay? So this is ketoacidosis. This is a, a flood that sweeps away villages and bridges and highways and stuff. This is a modest, gentle rain that nourishes. Starvation ketosis, that is eating no calories but not being diabetic, is in this range. With starvation ketosis, the kidney's handling of salt changes dramatically. When you, it turns out when you eat carbohydrates and you're carbohydrate fueled, your kidneys re retain salt. When you're keto adapted, your kidneys switch and dump salt. And part of the reason that that helps treat blood pressure? And that, that appears to be part of the reason that it, it, it treats blood pressure. But the other is that the tone of the blood vessels themselves change. And Jeff has done actually some pioneering work in that. Maybe you want to talk about vascular compliance. We've had an interest in a number of you know, biomarker responses to, to low carbohydrate diets, including vascular fun function and, and blood pressure. And we do see a, a very consistent lowering of blood pressure.
uh, and, and de delving a little deeper into the mechanism, I, I, I would agree with Steve that, it, that there's this naturesis effect and, and some of the uh, reduction in uh, excess water is contributing to the lower blood pressure. We've actually looked at the functioning of blood vessels using a, a technique called brachial artery reactivity that measures how the uh, major artery in your arm uh, responds to a hypoxic stimulus. And it, it's a rather standardized and routine test that's done in, in, in studies looking at, at how well blood vessels function. And uh, anyway, we, we put uh, people with metabolic syndrome on a very low carbohydrate diet to induce nutritional ketosis for 12 weeks, and we measured how well their vessels responded after that time period. And we, we showed that they actually improved compared to a more traditional low fat diet a group that followed uh, more or less the American Diabetes Association, American Heart Association type diet. We also looked at how these vessels responded uh, after a meal, very high in fat. There's a number of studies that show when you eat a McDonald's meal or a high fat meal that you see this dysfunction in, in the way the blood vessels respond. And, and so many people will teach away from fat because uh, you know this single meal caused vascular dysfunction. But coming back to the term Steve introduced, keto adaptation, when you allow people more than a couple weeks of consuming this type of diet, uh, you have a very different response to that same high fat meal. And instead of showing a dysfunction, you actually show an improvement in the way these blood vessels respond to stimuli. So you're improving actually endothelial function. These cells that line the vessels that release nitric oxide are, are actually functioning at a, at, a, at a more beneficial level. People talk about, oh, there was a study done, actually it's last year, one done in, in the British Isles with a, a, that proved that a low carbohydrate diet was bad for you. But it was a four, four day long study. Right, right. You know, if, if they'd done a four week long study, they almost assuredly would have gotten the opposite result. But A, it's cheaper to do a short term study, and B, if you want to prove, if you set out to prove that a quote Atkins diet is bad, um, do a four day study and you'll, you can probably find things that aren't functioning all that well in those four days. So in a fasting state, you measure blood sugar and you measure blood insulin levels. And the question is, at, at, to hold your blood sugar normal, how much insulin you, does your body have to make? And if you are insulin sensitive and you're, you want to hold your blood sugar here, then you might give, if you're sensitive, you keep your insulin down here. But if you're insulin resistant, you might still have the same blood sugar value, but it takes an insulin up here to keep it down there, to hammer it down there. This person's insulin resistant, and that person it will be, by analogy, carbohydrate intolerant. If you have a low, a normal blood sugar and a lowish normal insulin, then you're sensitive. And in a study done actually here on the peninsula by um, Dr. Chris Gardner and published in the uh, 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 JAMA back uh, in 2007 called the A to Z study, um, Dr. Gardner uh, put people on either high carb, intermediate carb, or low carbohydrate diets and followed them for a year and published that data. And uh, the low carbohydrate diet people on average did better not just initially, but over the longer term for many risk parameters. After he published that paper, he went back and re-examined the initial data. And what he found was that when people were insulin resistant, and if you put them on a high carbohydrate diet, they did very poorly. If they're insulin resistant and they put them on a low carbohydrate diet, they did very well, which says that the insulin resistance is a predictor of how well you respond and that carbohydrate restriction appears to be the better alternative for somebody who has this even normal blood sugar, but high insulin value. That's, the, I think, the best current test we have available. There's many things happening that, that sort of fold into what we consider carbohydrate intolerance, but fundamentally what's happening is when you consume carbohydrate, if, if you're processing that in a healthy way, it's primarily being oxidized into carbon dioxide and water. You use it as fuel and muscle primarily. When you're carbohydrate intolerant, uh, a significantly greater portion of the incoming dietary carbohydrate is actually being converted to fat in the liver. So it's this uh, mismanagement of dietary carbohydrate that is fundamental to the carbohydrate intolerant state. And so if you follow sort of that metabolic path, uh, if you're processing carbohydrates by converting them to fat, so de novo lipogenesis, uh, there are several downstream events that, that you could predict, such as uh, your triglycerides would go up in your blood that uh, you start to show a certain lipoprotein cholesterol particle size pattern in your blood characterized primarily by a predominance of the smaller LDL particles and this may be related to lower HDL and of course uh, this can lead down down the road to higher blood sugars uh, and perhaps other features of metabolic syndrome so I think if a person starts to 
to show more of these features that that's a harbinger that you know they're they're exceeding their body's carbohydrate tolerance and that they need to dial it down to, to get back into a, a level where they can manage it health, healthy. If a person is reasonably carbohydrate tolerant when they get to the point where they want to hold their weight stable, you can introduce carbohydrates back to the point where they begin to bump up against the point, the, 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 their, their level of intolerance. So as, as Jeff implied, if you measure blood triglycerides and they started out with high triglycerides, they lost considerable weight, their, their, their blood lipoprotein pattern got better, and then you retest the triglycerides at, say, three months into maintenance, and you see the triglycerides coming back up, they've probably gotten a little bit above where they should have been, they need to dial down in grams per day of carbohydrate. And that might be, for, in our experience, for people who have significant weight to lose or signs of metabolic syndrome, the upper end of carbohydrate tolerance for those people, even when they're normal weight, may be 100 to 150 grams per day. Um, most of those people should not go back to a high carbohydrate diet if they've gotten in trouble on high carb before. So if 100 grams per day of carbohydrate, that's 400 calories a day. Now, mo a, most low carbohydrate diets, in fact, most diets that are good for human beings are going to be moderate in protein. This idea that high carb, I'm sorry, that low carb equals high protein is, is a, a, a dangerous myth. Um, because we humans don't burn protein very well as fuel. If you have a dog, your dog is very good at burning protein for fuel. But we humans, moderate protein. So for me, maybe 100 to 150 grams of protein per day. It's about four calories per gram. So that's between 400 and 600 calories. I don't want to get too technical. But let's say I, I, I don't, but I'm over here eating 100 grams of carb a day, that's 400 calories. 150 grams of protein, that'd be 600 calories, 1,000 calories. But I'm you know, a, a 75 kilo, you know, 165 pound guy. I'm still pretty physically active and I burn over 2,500 calories a day. But between the, even the 100 grams a day of carb and the, the 150 grams of protein, I've only got 1,000 calories. The rest has to come from fat. So you introduce back carbs to the point of carb tolerance. You keep protein moderate because we don't, humans, A, protein costs a lot, B, we don't feel well if we eat way too much of it. So protein in moderation, and then the remaining fuel that you need for maintenance will come from a healthy mix of fats. Uh, and that's how we put together what we have termed a well-formulated carbohydrate controlled or carbohydrate restricted regimen that allows people not just to lose weight reasonably easily, not easy, but more easily than on other dietary approaches, as shown in Chris Gardner's study, but then how one can make it last for decades, not for six months or so.